All right, welcome to the third special topic that concentrates on applications to demonstrate the uh, uses of continuum mechanics in different contexts. And in this topic, we're going to look at the mechanics of soft materials. Now, um, Soft materials, as it is somewhat of a popular terminology for materials that uh, undergo uh, large deformations. So in um, classical mechanics, one does not encounter the uh, use of the terminology soft materials a lot. But uh, nevertheless, uh, it's, it's very descriptive of what we expect from the relevant analysis. We're talking about materials that essentially can easily deform under uh, even light loads. That's what a soft material means. And when we talk about the mechanics of such materials, we can again look at elastic or inelastic deformations. We're going to uh, concentrate on elastic deformations as a particular case, but up until that point actually, we're going to cover a number of things that are relevant to material behavior that could also be inelastic. Um, and um, of course, the mechanics that has to be formulated in a general setting where we allow large deformations. So we're not going to make uh, any special uh, assumptions that simplify the balance laws um, or uh, the expressions for stress and strain. So we're going to work in a general setting. And the starting point is internal power. So several of the concepts that I'm covering under particular special topics actually could have been covered uh, in the framework of the uh, core part of the course, the first part, or they could have been covered in um, also um, in some other special topic. But there is a uh, natural reason as to why, for instance, this concept should be covered in this special topic and you will see why it gives rise to something that is called eventually the, um, or it's, it helps us develop what is called the um, strain energy in a general setting. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to write first the linear momentum now, something that we already know, and I'm going to work with the local spatial form. Um, let's write this in this manner. Okay. And so we have a continuum, and for every point in the domain, this differential equation has to be satisfied. Um, so now, this is an equality that holds, or in other words, I can take this, put it to the left-hand side, something is equal to zero, it's equal to zero at every point in the domain. So since it's equal to zero, uh, what I can do is, I can take that difference, so I'm going to take rho v dot minus divergence t minus rho v, so that's equal to zero, and I'm going to integrate it over d. Uh, but I'm not only, so, so, so this is equal to zero, and hence if I integrate this vector over the domain, that's also uh, equal to zero, and that is as as yet a as of yet it's a vector, right? But since this is zero, if I multiply it by anything else, the multiplication is still zero, and I'm going to throw in some vector w. This vector is some spatial vector field. It can uh, its value can change. The components of the vector can change. Um, from position to position and through time, right? So, and what I can do is this is a vector, I can take the scalar product of this arbitrary vector with what is essentially zero and integrate that over the domain, the result is still equal to zero. So, so what, what are we getting at? What do we gain out of this? So let's see. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the terms out. Um, so we have integral over the spatial configuration, w rho v dot, minus integral rho r w divergence t. And integral 
drill. Sorry. Integral over R, W dot rho. Uh, so among these terms, the second term, in other words, the scalar product, integral of a domain integral, volume integral of, a, of the scalar product of a vector with the divergence of a tensor, it's a term that you worked on when we were talking about um, um, integral um, relations that relate surface integrals to volume integrals. In a homework problem, you worked on this term, and you found out that one can express it as, in homework number three specifically, so I'm just writing the result, it's equivalent to that. So you've done the ver derivation, so you know how it works out. Now, at that time, of course, uh, the tensor here was arbitrary, and therefore the tensor operating on the outward unit normal did not have any specific meaning. But in this case, we're talking about the Cauchy stress tensor operating on the outward unit normal, and this is nothing but the attraction vector. So we now have a further simplification. Um, so, I can put these together, so I'm going to write, or after a uh, rearrangement, uh, what I'm going to do is, so on the right hand side, the first term is w dot rho v dot integrated. So I'm going to put that term on the left hand side. And then there is the minus of another negative term, integral of gradient W dotted with the Cauchy stress tensor, so that makes a plus. So gradient W dot T dB. And I'm going to retain the other terms on the other side, and they have positive uh, signs, so that one is integral of W rho V, and the other one is W dot T. Okay, so what we've done is we've taken the linear momentum balance, put it inside an integral, and I took a scalar product with an arbitrary vector W, and the integral is equal to zero. It has to be if the field V and T are such that they satisfy the linear momentum down. So I cannot throw in here any traction on the surface and any stress field and any velocity field and hence its rate as an acceleration. They have to be the ones that appear in the, that have to be the ones that satisfy the linear momentum down. So if that is the case, then this result also holds. So well, what do we gain out of it? So it seems quite uh, it seems quite useless at this stage. But uh, those of you who are familiar with finite elements actually might already recognize that it is reminiscent, quite reminiscent, and uh, rightly so, of uh, what is called the uh, weak form. But presently, this one also has a name um, in mechanics. It is called the principle of The lumber. Okay. Um, and in the particular case where the acceleration is not there, so you could still have deformation, but deformation in such a way that acceleration is omitted. You take a piece of material, you pull on it so slowly that, let's say, acceleration inertial effects are negligible. So in that case, we talk about either statics, no motion at all, or super slow motion, so that acceleration does not play a role. In that case, we would say quasi-statics. So if you have such a scenario, the principle of D'Alembert has a special name. It's called the principle of virtual work, which actually you have learned and used as an undergraduate 
mechanics students. Now, if you go back and look at the expression and discussion of ritual work there, you may not be immediately, of course, link it to the expression that we have here, but nevertheless, they are related. Uh, so, now, we have an expression where we have a set of um, three terms. Okay, so this here is one term that's important. This is another term that's important. And I'll lump all of the terms on the right-hand side uh, under number three. Um, so, now, this principle holds for any choice of W. Okay? It's entirely arbitrary. It's irrelevant. Of course, there are some intricacies always. I'm so, assuming for probably sufficient smoothness of the fields, etc. Uh, but under standard assumptions that we have implicitly invoked anyway in many transitions. So what I'm going to do is, although I say W is any W, uh, I'm going to pick it to be a special vector field. In fact, I'm to going to pick it to be the velocity field. I can choose it to be anything. So I pick it to be the velocity field. So now, pick W equals You don't have to, but that's, that's what our choice is. So then, I look at the terms one by one. First, I look at the first term, and I notice that the first term is nothing but so, so when we were discussing rigid plate dynamics, with, we have written the expression for total kinetic energy. Uh, I noticed that the first term is nothing but the time rate of change of total kinetic energy of the body, uh, because the total kinetic energy is one half integral r rho v dot v. Okay. So if this one half goes in there, if I take the time rate of change, notice that rho and dv appear together. So the rule is you just take the time derivative of this. You can move the time derivative inside to calculate that. So that will be time derivative of that, and that will be twice v dot v. The tools cancel, you're left with v dot v dot. Okay. So that's precisely what the first term is, rate of change of total kinetic energy. Now let's see, we'll have a look at the third term. The third term, what's on the right hand side, is uh, what we're going to define as um, external power. Why is it the power of external forces? Because the traction is something that's applied on the surface. It appears like a boundary condition, something that we can eventually either calculate or we know beforehand what it is. And uh, the body force is something that is prescribed. Um, and so eventually we have per unit volume velocity times force. Okay? And that is a power. Okay? Uh, all the external forces. Right? So we understand the meaning, physical meaning of the first, uh, of the first and the third terms. Let us look at a, the second term. Okay. Now we're going to analyze that term in more detail, but it's most appropriate to call that term power of internal forces. Now, of course, we do not have a point-wise force field or anything. We can define a point-wise traction for a given direction at a given time. Okay? So that is like a force, but what we really have is stress. Okay? And that implicitly defines the traction anyway at any point in any given direction. So, but that's a common terminology. Okay? So uh, when I put these together, therefore, and if I write this expression as similar using these abbreviations, what we have is the right-hand side, which is power of external forces, is equal to T dot plus P internal. Okay. Uh, and now the meaning becomes more clear, perhaps, in this uh, compact expression. You put a certain amount of work per unit time into the object, of course, as a result of that, the object can change its kinetic energy, right? 
Uh, but there is also something that is associated with the fact that it is deforming. And as it deforms, it also stores energy due to deformation. You have an elastic, you have a rubber band, right? You stretch it, and that requires energy. You put work into the material, it goes partially <coughs> into that as well, right? So the power that you input increases the kinetic energies, and some amount of it goes into the fact that the material is deforming and work is needed to induce that deformation. Now, that work may be stored or may be partially dissipated, converted into heat. We do not know, but for sure, in any case, some deformed work is needed, power is needed to deform the material. Okay? Whether it is 100% stored, or 100% dissipated, or somewhere in between. Okay? Uh, so, this one is physically, therefore, associated the, with the work uh, needed for It does, it does, yeah. So, so, so it does, so that is the expression for the total kinetic energy for a rigid body we decompose it into pure translational and rotational parts. Uh, for a deformable body we cannot do that, so it incorporates everything. Where is the potential energy itself? I lift the object. Energy changes. Where is that? Kinetic energy, internal power, external power. It's in the external power. It's in here, right? So it takes that. That term takes care of everything. Okay. Um, all right. So um, now let's have a look at the second term. Now the second term is an interesting term. We're looking at the internal power, and so we have the Cauchy stress tensor multiplying the gradient of W, which is equal to velocity. So that's the velocity gradient tensor, and we called it L a long time ago, right? Um, so that is the um, second term, right? Um, now, I'll make a series of transformations and express the same thing in different forms. Now, first of all, this is JD capital V, so I can pull back to the reference configuration. And now I have T multiplying J here, which we define to be the Kirchhoff stress tensor, and that was actually one use of the Kirchhoff stress tensor, so that I can precisely do this without J appearing explicitly. So we have that equality. Um, and now I can express L as well. L is F dot F inverse. We discussed that as well some time ago. And now I can take this F inverse, right, and pull it to the left hand side of the scalar product as a transpose, so F minus transpose. F minus transpose F dot capital D. All right. Now, tau F minus transpose, and tau is J times the Cauchy stress tensor. So, J T F minus transpose, you can easily check your, uh, check, your, check your notes. You don't have to know this by heart, but that's precisely equal to the first pillar Kirchhoff stress tensor. Okay. Uh, and the first pillar Kirchhoff stress tensor defines the second pillar Kirchhoff stress tensor as. Fs. Okay. So now we have those equalities as well. Now I'm going to go in two different ways 
So first of all, I'm going to take restate that equality, or, or that. I'm going to extract these two and write it to both once again. So we have that equals R naught P F dot D capital B. Okay. And now I'm going to do a similar trick, uh, similar to the one that we use going from there to there. So here I have suppose fs, and this f can be put to the right hand side of the scalar product as a transpose. So I'm going to have s dotted with f transpose f dot. So let me write that here as well. Integral r naught s f transpose f dot capital B. And S is a symmetric tensor, that is the nice thing about it. And um, now this is now going to be a transition that we have not explicitly shown, but that will be a nice exercise. And the exercise is, suppose you take two tensors, A, which is symmetric, and B, which is arbitrary, okay? Then, A dot B is equal to A, B, symmetric, okay? In other words, the scalar product of a symmetric tensor with any other tensor is equal to that symmetric tensor dotted with the symmetric part of the tensor. In other words, the skew symmetric part dotted with A has to be equal to zero, and that's what you can show in pretty much a single line. Okay, so I'm going to make use of that. So this is symmetric, this is not symmetric, but the result is equal to S dot the symmetric part of that, F transpose F dot <coughs> symmetric, okay? And that term, let me write that in green, is equal to one half F transpose F dot, plus f dot transpose f. Now that last green term is actually equal to the time rate of change of the Lagrangian strain tensor because E is one half C minus identity or F transpose F minus identity. You take the dot of that, so one half F transpose F dot plus F dot transpose F. That's the second term. And identity dot is equal to zero, right? So that's E dot. Hence, we have yet another expression S dot E dot. And the terms that appear in the integral are called stress power, okay? And you see that we have two equivalent forms. One is p dot f dot, and the other one is s dot e dot, okay? So different measures of deformation, a fundamental one, and a strain tensor, and different measures of stress. But the expression, uh, numerically, let me say, number-wise, is the same there. So based on that transition, you can do a number of things. One, you can go back to the principle of mutual work and you may want to express that in referential form. So now what we've done is actually we've re-expressed this term 
in referential form in those derivations, right? This one is very easy because these two become rho naught d capital B. Likewise, that one's easy. And this is integral over the referential surface, pure attraction in capital A. That's the easy transition as well. So immediately, once we have that result, that's one thing we can do. Now, another thing we can do is work on these terms a little bit more, and that's what we're going to do next. We will interpret how this term as a whole changes when we take an object and we deform it. But not in any special way we're going to deform it over a cycle. In other words, I'm going to take an object, let's say I'm going to pull it, and then I'm going to stretch it back to its original position. And I'm going to think about what that term should integrate to over that cycle of deformation if the material is elastic. Okay? So, but before we do that, so I've said these are the stress power terms. Now, of course, you notice that over the reference configuration, the same term is this. So that's a different expression of those terms, or this is a different expression of that term. This is also stress power per unit volume of the reference configuration. This is also stress power per unit volume of the spatial configuration, right? But what is nice about these two terms is that you see uh, a direct conjugacy between a measure of stress and a measure of deformation. You have some stress dotted with something time derivative. Something time derivative. Whereas here, let's say you don't see that. Okay? And uh, so because you don't see that, we are going to find uh, easier to work uh, with these terms. Okay? All right, so let's do that. Let's work with the stress power. Right, and now, now the now the uh, also right the uh, interpretation of the um, internal power work needed for def deforming the material is more apparent in different meanings or different uh, interpretations um, in terms of quantities that measure the stress and the corresponding uh, stress and strain or stress and deformation. Right, it's like force times velocity. Right, but uh, in a more general context point-wise through the deformable object where we really do not have a force field. What we have is a stress field. And what should multiply that is not a velocity field, but something that is associated with the velocity for sure. Okay, because right, this is the referential gradient of the velocity field actually, right? Partial small x over partial capital X. Time derivative moves on to the spatial position vector referential gradient of the velocity field. So still the velocity is in there, but implicitly, right? Stress coupled to uh, strain is what we have. Okay. Um, <coughs> all right, let's, let's proceed with the goal. So we're going to discuss that term in the context of elastic materials. And the topic is specifically called hyperelasticity. So uh, that is a more, let's say, compared to uh, mechanics of soil materials, that's a more um, accepted term in the field. But of course, it specifically emphasizes elastic deformations. But just like linear elasticity, it is the basis for developing inelastic or analyzing inelastic material behavior. So first we have to understand that and then we can understand inelastic deformations uh, in a large kinematical setting. So I'm going to draw here a plot. So it looks three-dimensional but that's not position. These rather indicate the eigenvalues of the Lagrangian strain tensor. So one, two, and three. Now, we're trying to characterize the Lagrangian strain tensor through its eigenvalues. Of course, it, the characterization entails not only the eigenvalues, but also the eigenvectors. Okay? But I will make a point here. Of course, in general, it does matter for complex, to avoid the complex, so I'm not indicating them. But um, uh, in general, in, in the specific case of isotropy that I will eventually mention, 
the orientation of the eigenvectors really does not play a role anyway. So we have a space of deformation that is characterized only by the eigenvalues. Okay? And I'm, let's say, in a certain state of deformation. Okay. It doesn't have to be none. So the origin is zero deformation. F equals, let's say, identity or pure rotation for that matter. Uh, but I'm over here. Okay. That's state number one. And there's a state number two that's a different state of deformation. And now what I'd like to go uh, do is I'd like to go from state number one to state number two. And there are many different paths for doing that. So, for instance, I can go like this. Let's go that path A. Okay. I could have chosen another path. I could have gone like that. That would be path, let's say, C. Okay. Likewise, I can come back along any different path. Okay. I can come back along A. I can come back along a path B. I've just chosen some random path uh, B. Yeah. And now what I do is I try to characterize the amount of work that I need to do to take the material from one point to another one and then back. Okay? That has to do with the time integral of the power of uh, internal um, forces. So first I look at the work. that is needed right, at a point okay. so in fact I'm not taking the internal power as a whole that's an integral over the whole volume I'm just looking at the integral integral which is s dot e dot actually but what I'm doing is if you like I have s dot dE dt, and I'm integrating that over a path that is parametrized likewise by time, if you like, right? And so these two terms give me e. So I'm at a point in the domain. At that point, the power, the stress power is S e dot, and because the stress and strain fields change, when I carry out the integration, the total stress power that is needed when I go, or the stress power integrated from state one to state two, that's a time integral, that is integral from one to two S dot dE. Um, and so that's from one to two. And likewise, I can look at the work that is needed to go to B on path B from 2 to 1. Okay. So this is the work going from 2 to B on B. Okay. I could go back along some other path, but no, that's my choice. That's my path B. Okay. So that's 2 to 1 S dot D. And now I sum these up. So I have an integral of a term going from 1 to 2 and then from 2 to 1. So that becomes an integral over a cycle, starting from 1 and ending up with 1. Okay. So that always holds. At a point in the domain, I calculated the time integral of the stress power, and that is the result. It's a cyclic integral, right, over my closed path, and that is equal to something. Now, it might equal to something that is non-zero, uh, but I'm going to assume that the material is, first of all, elastic. 
So it's now like I take a rubber band and I stretch it and then take it back to its original location. Now for that matter, I can do a very complex deformation as well, shear, torsion, whatever of a structure, but eventually always going back one to two and then two to one, to the same point. And what is the integral of the stress power? What's our expectation? Should be equal to zero, okay? So now when you say it is equal to zero, you are saying that your material is not dissipating any energy and that is intrinsically the definition of elasticity, okay? or it's a part of the definition of elasticity. So that's where the critical transition is. And actually you are somehow saying more. What you're saying is, uh, additionally we can sort of pull up branches from that discussion. What you're saying is the work, the stress power integrated over a cycle is zero. That's actually equivalent to saying that the stress power going from one to two is independent of the path. In other words, the stress power from one to two over A is equal to the stress power from one to two over C, etc. Okay? So that is essentially an equivalent statement. All of those indicate that this integral is path independent. Okay? Um, so I'm going to write that as well. But it has other implications as well. And the implication eventually is that when I have such an integral from one to two, this term must be the differential of some scalar field. This is a scalar. The fact that it has to be path independent entails that this term has to be the differential of some field. Let me write that field as W. Okay. That's what the uh, analysis implies. And this is from 2 to 1 dW. And now everything makes sense because then the sum is equal to an integral over the cycle of dW, which is the value of W at the beginning minus the value of W at the end, which are the same, because it's over a cycle. Okay? So that term drops out. Okay? And therefore, what we have is that dW is equal to, right, as I've written here, s dot d. Um, and the only way this can happen is, if you like, you can now, as it's a transition similar to what we have done when we were analyzing the, or defining the deformation gradient, dW is s dot d means that s has to be equal to del w over del e. Okay. And I'm writing a partial derivative because e has several components. Okay. So that result says that the stress must come from the derivative of a scalar field with respect to whatever it is that controls the state of stress. In this case, it's the strain. Okay? And the whole discussion, if you like, is similar to your Physics 101 course, where you said, oh, suppose I have a charge and there's an electric field and I'd like to calculate the network done going from one to t two, and that is path independent, and hence, the electric field must come from the derivative of a potential, etc. cetera. Okay? That's exactly a identical um, discussion. Um, and let me do a remark. Of course, I've done some hand waving here, but it turns out that this result, namely the fact that the stress must come from the derivative of a potential, applies whether or not the material is elastic. Okay, actually, in inelasticity as well, this must always hold. S is partial W, partial E. Okay, but presently we're only concentrating on elasticity. Um, so let me summarize the results, the stress must come from a potential, and that potential in this case is a W, uh, but we do have some constraints, and the constraints are that work on a closed path. So constraints with respect to this particular derivation at least, work on a closed path should vanish, or equivalently, work done is path independent.
Okay, so you can go along A or C to reach from one to two, but the integrands are the integrals are the same. All right. Now that result, the fact that the stress comes from a potential, um, together with the assumption of elasticity gives us an expression, a general expression for defining stress in terms of strain. Okay. And that relation in the context of elastic materials is called hyperelasticity. You have a potential, the potential is a function of the Lagrangian strain tensor. You take its derivative with respect to that quantity, you get the stress. Now, when I was making the derivation, I expressed the stress power as S dot S scalar product E dot. If you pursue the same, the very same discussion with the stress power as P scalar product F dot, you will reach a similar result for the Piola-Kirchhoff, first Piola-Kirchhoff stress tensor. So in other words, you can also express the um, first Piola-Kirchhoff stress tensor as the partial derivative of that potential with respect to F, and that potential is called the strain energy function. And it's very meaningful when we have this restriction of elasticity because the amount of energy that is stored at a point, so hence per unit volume, uh, when you take the material from state one to two at that point, the amount of energy stored is precisely the change in the value of W when going from state one to two. You just calculate the value of W at state one, value of W at state two, you subtract, that's your um, additional energy input to take that material from state one to two. Okay. If you have a material that is dissipated, of course, the amount of energy that you need to put in to take the material from state one to two is that, perhaps, um, in addition to that, a number of other things, okay? Because the material will dissipate and uh, the total strain energy, the elastic energy storage is not equal to the total work done, okay? Okay, so uh, another remark, um, so I have a series of remarks. I'm not writing all of them down. Um, I'm writing down only what is absolutely essential, but just another remark. So this is sometimes called also nonlinear elasticity, but that's also somehow misleading. Now, in linear elasticity, we have sigma equals C epsilon, okay? Um, some people argue that uh, you cannot have a relation of the type, let's say, sigma equals c epsilon squared. That doesn't make sense because epsilon is small anyway, so you cannot have terms that are quadratic. But sometimes for analysis purposes, people also put a nonlinear elastic deformation using small measures of stress and strain, something like sigma equals c1 epsilon plus c2 epsilon squared, let's say. I'm making up some, some expressions here. Uh, so that's also nonlinear elasticity, but really, strictly speaking, when you say nonlinear elasticity, one really refers to uh, large deformations and nonlinear elasticity, uh, the stresses and strains you should make use of are SNE, PNF, et cetera, okay? Um, so that is already nonlinear elasticity, that is actually hyperelasticity. But why do we also sometimes put in hyper here? Because there, are, there were, in the early developments, other descriptions of elastic deformation, or presumably elastic deformations, at large kinematical 
uh, motions, okay? And at that time, people did not realize that the stress, some people at least, did not realize that the stress had to come from a potential, okay? So they, write, they wrote down some expression for the stress in terms of strain, and they said, oh, look, here I have a stress in terms of the Lagrangian strain components. And that's what I expect in general. S is a function of strain, so this must be an elastic material. But that's not always so, because not every tensorial function of another tensorial function can be expressed as the derivative with respect to some scalar field, okay? And so just like not any vector field is the derivative of some scalar potential. And what that means is that if you take such a material description Suppose I have an elastic band that obeys some presumably elastic behavior, but it does not come from a potential distress. Then what you can do is you can take the elastic material, stretch it, and then push it back, or do some equivalent elastic cycle. Elastic cycle, the network done will not be zero, and that is not elastic. Okay, so the ones that do undergo correct elastic deformations are called hyperelastic. Okay. So that was like a distinction at some point to highlight that this is the correct way to go, let me say. Um, all right, so we are in good shape. So we have somehow derived, partially rigorously, partially by waving our hands, a strain energy function and an expression that relates stress to uh, deformation. Um, and now, um, let me proceed with a discussion that pertains to the particular forms of the strain energy function. So now, what I am interested in practice is always an expression for the stress as a measure of the deformation. So now, I do know something. I know that the stress does come from a scalar potential, but I don't know the form of that scalar potential. Just like I know rigorously, theoretically, that sigma must be equal to C epsilon, but I don't know what C is. To determine this unknown in linear elasticity, the uh, tensor C, fourth order tensor, in this case, the strain energy function, I need to do experiments, okay? We must do experiments. So, that's what we are driving at. How do we write down the particular form of the strain energy function for a given material? What does it look like? And just like the coefficients, the values of C, and in fact, the particular form of the, um, the stiffness tensor depends on the particular material you're looking at, right? You can have many different isotropic materials. The values of the constants will change, but also the form of the tensor will also change. For isotropy, you have only two constants. For orthotropy, you have nine constants, etc. Likewise, in the description of the strain energy function for different types of material, you can have different numbers of constants. The form, the functional form, will change, okay? So I'm going to give you some examples to that. But eventually, any given form, if I am given any form, I need to be able to eventually calculate the stress. And that calculation also entails some difficulties. Let's address those. So first of all, um, let's visit isotropic materials. Now I know what isotropy means. It means insensitivity to orientation, okay? So mechanically, point-wise, I have three principal stretches. Okay, which implicitly define the three eigenvalues of the Lagrangian strain tensor. Now, insensitivity to orientation means that the total strain energy that is stored at a given point for a given set of three eigenvalues does not depend on the orientation of these eigenvalues. In other words, the eigenvectors don't matter. That's what isotropy means. If it's anisotropic, it will matter. There is directional dependence. But if it's isotropic, it will not. So for an isotropic material, the orientation of the three eigenvalues does not change the stored energy. OK? 
Okay. So um, we have the expression for E. Uh, it's the eigenvalues times the eigenvectors, eigenvector basis. Okay. That's the spectral decomposition theorem. And what we're saying is that the orientation of E does not matter, which means that if I take E and rotate it in any way, and that rotation is described as we know as such, that's the rotation of a tensor. And now Q will go on to QV alpha, and Q transpose will go into that V. That's the rotation of E. And now this verbal expression mathematically is equivalent to saying that the value of W for E is equal to the value of W for Q E Q transpose. Um, now, we have, of course, already verbally expressed, we've said that the orientation of the eigenvalues uh, does not matter. It implicitly says that W should only be a function of these three eigenvalues somehow, but this is a slightly better way, a more mathematical way of expressing that result. So I've thrown an E and I've rotated it arbitrarily, and what I'm saying is any arbitrary rotation of E will give the same value of W. And now once I write this, that's not a very trivial statement in general. If you forget about the physical interpretation, a scalar function of a tensorial variable is equal to the same function evaluated at an arbitrary rotation of E, where Q is proper orthogonal. Uh, then there, it turns out, exists a theorem, it's called the representation theorem, uh, which says that such a function should only depend on the three eigenvalues of the symmetric tensor E. Okay, so that's the result. So then, an isotropic representation theorem states that W should be expressible only in terms of the eigenvalues. I'll write that function with a bar. Uh, it's a different functional representation. And that functional representation, as its argument, takes in the eigenvalues. Okay. Now, those are the three eigenvalues. You can, of course, define any other three variables that are functions of the eigenvalues. In particular, you can instead of the three eigenvalues, make use of the three invariants of the Lagrangian strain tensor. The first invariant is a sum, the third invariant is a product, etc. right? So that's a implicitly equivalent expression. In fact, E differs from the right Cauchy-Green deformation tensor C, F transpose F, only through a factor and an identity. So you can also write the same thing as a function of the three um, invariants of the, of the tensor C, F transpose F, and so on. Okay? So that's also sometimes what you see. W is expressed as a function of the three invariants of C, but they are all equivalent in some sense. Okay. So now that's nice. I'm going to eventually make use of that. Uh, it's nice because um, it has, we have simplified a very general expression to something that is more specific. This one has six independent components, this re functional representation, because E has six independent components. But now we've argued that because of this equality, or because of the fact that physically interpreta physical interpretation is the orientation does not matter, what really matters is the three invariants of E alone. So I have three degrees of freedom. Okay? Um, 
So now I have to go ahead and when I calculate the stress from this particular potential representation, I need to eventually take derivatives with respect to Lagrangian strain tensor and we're going to do that. Okay, so you may wonder why did I write here an isotropic representation theorem? Because this equality, okay, implies isotropy, but there are similar equalities, um, or, or qualitatively they look similar, there will be other ingredients as well, that apply to anisotropic materials. And similar equalities help us eventually restrict this very general form to particular expressions for the strain energy function, as we have done here, reducing the number of degrees of freedom or simplifying the description as, at least. And that would be called an anisotropic representation theorem. You will have at least one chance to uh, discuss such a representation in a problem. So uh, now, we're in a, so what do we have so far? You see this, you understand we have a, we're not talking about inelasticity, so we have a elastic material and in particular a hyperelastic material because I know how to calculate the stress from this potential. So let's do that, let's calculate the potential. So I'm going to go back and proceed from there. So now for an isotropic material, and here now I'm going to make use of um, some homework results that you worked on, specifically homework three. So this is what I'd like to calculate, but my function is in terms of the three invariants. So I need to do a chain rule. So first, partial derivative with respect to the first invariant. First invariant with respect to E, plus same thing with respect to the second invariant. And then with respect to the third invariant. And all of those terms are terms you've worked on. So you've determined that, for instance, this one is equal to identity. That term is equal to trace of the identity minus the tensor itself. And this one is the determinant of the E, E inverse. Okay, so what we see here, if you look here for a second, uh, we have obtained the second polar Kirchhoff stress tensor in terms of the following tensors, identity, the Lagrangian strain tensor, and its inverse. So several weeks ago, right, I discussed the Cayley-Hamilton theorem, and I said it allows us to do nice things like expressing the inverse of a tensor in a slightly different fashion. If you go back to that expression that we've tried, we've expressed the inverse in terms of the Lagrangian strain tensor up to quadratic terms. So this can be expressed as things that are up to the quadratic order of the Lagrangian strain tensor. And hence, if I plug in that expression upon making use of the Cayley-Hamilton theorem, you have the expression in your notes, you will find that S can be expressed in terms of quantities that involve identity, Lagrangian strain tensor, and quadratic uh, Lagrangian strain tensor squared. And the coefficients I will indicate by zeroth power, first power, and the second power of E. And alpha zero, alpha one, and alpha two are coefficient functions, scalar functions of Lagrangian strain tensor, okay, implicitly, and I encourage you to do that exercise, right? 
and derive the forms of these coefficients. So you will find that alpha zero is del W del I E plus So what you have to do is you have to just plug in the Cayley Hamilton using the Cayley Hamilton theorem expression for E inverse group terms that multiply I, E, and E squared, then you will find these coefficients. Okay, please do that. All right. So now this result is a nice result and let me tell you why. It gives us a clear distinction between linear and nonlinear elasticity. What is linear elasticity? Well, we have discussed that sigma must be equal to C epsilon, okay? Um, there is only one measure of stress, there is only one measure of strain and the relation is linear. This thing is a constant. Okay. So here we have nonlinearity. And it has two parts. It pertains to, first of all, the material behavior. So we have a materially nonlinear expression. And the second one pertains to the kinematics. We have a kinematically nonlinear description. Why do we have a kinematically nonlinear description? Because I've chosen the Lagrangian strain tensor in this expression. It's important that this is the Lagrangian strain tensor. I cannot go ahead and plug in here the Eulerian strain tensor. It's meaningless. This is spatial. This is referential, etc. Their values differ from each other a lot at large deformations. Yes, if the deformations are small, and that pertains to the kinematics, then there is only one measure, and that's epsilon. And here on the left-hand side, there is S, not P. The choice is not arbitrary, okay? But here there is only one, that's sigma. Now that's kinematic nonlinearity, but there is also material nonlinearity. The relation here is linear, whereas you already see here that even if these constants were actually, or actually these coefficients are constants, they are numbers, S is at least quadratic in E. So there is no linear relation between the stress and strain. So we have material, functional nonlinearity. But we have to immediately remember or realize that these coefficients are not constants themselves because W is a function of these variables. So these coefficients are actually could be arbitrarily complex functions of E, okay? So in other words, even this term here could be, let's say, some logarithmic function of the Lagrangian strain tensor and that's a highly nonlinear term. Okay, so we have a lot of nonlinearity in that expression. Okay, so we have material and uh, kinematic nonlinearity embedded in that result. Okay, so now this is nice. This is a particular expression for the stress in terms of the strain uh, when we have isotropy, isotropic hyperelasticity. But still, I haven't answered the question, what is W? I'm assuming I know W, but I don't. In other words, here, I don't have anything that distinguishes, let's say, rubber from muscle. They are both soft materials, but what's the difference? The difference comes in through the particular expression for W. They will have different functional representations. They will have different numbers of coefficients. And even if you could use the same functional representation, the values of those coefficients that appear, constants that appear in that representation will be different because you're talking about different materials, okay? Uh, so next time, we will talk about particular representations for W uh, for hyperelasticity, for isotropic hyperelasticity, right? So that's our goal for next time. So until then. <laughs>